Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, now we're going to turn to uh, a member of the House of Representatives, uh, Congressman Steve uh, Stivers, who is a member of the House uh, Financial Services Committee uh, from Ohio. We're going to principally talk about uh, business continuity insurance. The, the shorthand would be pandemic risk uh, insurance coverage. And as we all know, since the crisis has started, uh, the insurance availability for businesses from catastrophic pandemic events uh, is certainly lacking, to say the least. Uh, existing business interruption policies don't cover this. Uh, the lack of availability is raising great concerns for all policyholders, obviously owners of real estate, but also those who produce uh, other types of, of, of assets, the uh, movie industry, for example, event industry, sporting events, and so forth, all are uh, concerned about this. Uh, a few legislative proposals have been introduced. Um, the Real Estate Roundtable, along with NAREIT and other uh, partners in the real estate community, have joined forces with uh, other interested policyholders to try and develop uh, a proposal that would work uh, for us. We've been spending time meeting with the insurance industry uh, to try and understand how they want to participate in this program. And we've been working with members of Congress to try and find uh, a way forward. You know, a lot of people will call and say, why can't this just be like TRIA? And the differences are really quite stark. It's not that easy. And we're going to talk a little bit about that with Mr. Uh, Stivers. Um, a couple things about him. As I said, he's a congressman from uh, Ohio. He's been with us many times, by the way, at our uh, dinners that we typically have at these uh, meetings. Um, he's on the House of Financial Services Committee. He is the ranking member on the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance. Um, I mentioned TRIA. He played a very, very positive and constructive role in last year's uh, seven-year extension of TRIA, which we were very happy to get done. Imagine if we were trying to get that done this year. Uh, throughout his service, he's been on the Financial Services uh, Committee. Uh, by the way, the subcommittee also oversees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, so this is a very important uh, person for uh, our industry uh, and the economy. He was in the Ohio Senate uh, prior to being in Congress. He was uh, with Bank One, so he's a business person. Um, and he's also a full-time soldier, and I think that it's important that we recognize the service that he's provided over the decades, I think 25, 30 years of service. He was in the Iraqi uh, freedom operation, uh, commanded uh, a good number of people, all of whom returned home uh, safely. He's a brigadier a general. He received the bronze a star for his service. And we are absolutely delighted uh, to have Mr. Stivers with us. So uh, Congressman, let's Great just- Great to be with you, Jeff. Let's just get right into it, sir. Let's do uh, it. What do you, uh, I mean, how do you see this business continuity thing and, and the effect of the pandemic economically? We know the health concerns, but economically in your district, and why are you so focused on this? Well, obviously, this was an intentional shutdown of our economy. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we had good economic growth at almost 3 to 4%. We had wages going up, especially for low-wage uh, low earners. Uh, we had a great economy moving, but then uh, the pandemic happened and we intentionally shut down our economy. And uh, that, uh, that means that uh, it's impacted thousands and thousands of businesses across this country uh, negatively. I'm seeing some businesses that may not reopen as a result of closures from COVID-19. Uh, obviously, the entertainment industry was hit very hard. Anybody in the people moving business, whether it be airplanes or buses or those kind of things were hit pretty hard. Hotels were hit pretty hard. Uh, some commercial uh, real estate was hit hard early. We're hoping that's starting to come back. And now we're starting to see uh, that after the unemployment insurance is finished, um, even though there's still a moratorium on evictions, we're starting to actually see an uptick in delinquencies on residential um, uh, real estate. So uh, I think we need to do something to make sure that if this ever happens again, it was you know the government that caused a shutdown of the economy, the government needs to be involved to make sure we hold people harmless um, and businesses harmless in the future. Uh, we've also seen um, 
you know, the business interruption insurance uh, not being willing to cover any pandemics, event cancellation insurance that did cover pandemics has now essentially ground to a halt as well. Uh, production insurance for movies and television uh, does now, ex now excludes pandemics. So we've got to do something. I think you're going to start to see lenders uh, excluding pandemics or requiring some type of pandemic coverage in their loan covenants in the coming years, maybe not in the coming months, but I think we need to get ahead of this now. And Carolyn Maloney has introduced a bill. It's not a bill that I believe works in its current form because it gives insurers the chance to opt out. And uh, if nobody offers the insurance, then it won't work. Um, several groups, including some insurance groups, Chubb and Farmers, Zurich, have offered proposals. NARIT has offered a proposal. Um, and uh, so has uh, another uh, industry group. So uh, I'm excited that, um, that you guys at the round table are engaged in this. Uh, you know, I'm less interested in creating uh, a Republican alternative to Carolyn Maloney's bill than I am fixing her bill and making it widely bipartisan and something that solves the problem so we can move forward and actually be ready for the next hundred years uh, of, you know, whatever that brings on a pandemic. We were lucky that, you know, this pandemic was the, la the first one in 110, I'm sorry, 102 years since 1918, but uh, we might not be a hundred years between this one and the next one. Yeah, th thank you for those comments. And, and uh, really the TRIA uh, comparison is, is interesting because prior to 9-11, uh, uh, terrorism risk was covered in your all risk policy. That's what the litigation right. proved and, afterwards. But pandemics have historically not been, and that's one of the things that's very different between these two models, as well as the size and scale. I mean, when a, a terrorist, uh, attack happens. It has a kinetic attack, has uh, a ground zero, and then it has people impacted like 9-11. But uh, then uh, there are um, a lot of other folks that aren't as impacted. So uh, this was a national shutdown of our economy, which is a huge scale of trillions of dollars. Yeah, that, that is really right on, sir. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, bank lending or, or lending financing in general. The other item that, just to bring you to your attention, leasing, straight leases between landlords and business tenants are going to increasingly have this discussion and people are going to yep. want to be protected in some uh, way here. So it's very, very important. Um, you, you also mentioned another thing that, I, that we strongly and Maloney, but a bill that could be bipartisan. What, how do you feel about all of this? Well, I think we have to come up with a bipartisan solution because, um, you know, for the House to be relevant, we've got to pass something that has a big bipartisan vote uh, because whatever is really going to happen in the Senate has to get 60 votes. So it needs to ultimately bi be bipartisan. I'd rather make it bipartisan coming out of the House because I think that gives us a chance to get some momentum and make something happen. Uh, as I said, uh, Carolyn Maloney's bill is a good start, but it needs some pretty significant changes in order to solve the problem, have insurance company buy-in that is necessary, and also to um, actually have the kind of acceptance rate in the marketplace that we need to solve the problem, um, you know, to actually have the scale to solve the problem. So I, I think if we don't have 60 to 70% of businesses that could be impacted uh, choose to take these policies, then we probably haven't solved the problem. And, and that, you know, in the TRIA bill, one item that seems like it could come over in, in this area is the mandatory make available issue because, yeah. you know, you, we do not want insurers to simply say, well, I'm not gonna offer this, pro, this product. Uh, and if, if they're writing insurance, they should offer it, it seems to us or they should arrange for a third party to offer it to come in. I assume yep. you agree. With I that. totally agree with that. I think uh, the other thing that I want to do, though, is help uh, define the box of the liability for those insurance companies so that uh, a reinsurance market, private reinsurance market, will develop. But I think uh, one of my other principles in this is that I'd like to see us build private capacity over time so that uh, the private insurance companies 
build their ability to, um, to cushion some of this. And obviously, if it's uh, the kind of pandemic we had, uh, we'll have to have some federal government involvement. But over time, over you know, 50, 40, 50, 60 years, I want to build enough private capacity inside the insurance marketplace um, through reserves so that they can help weather this storm as well. So, um, you know, I think that is important and that's only going to happen if we have a mandatory offer. But again, if I can help define the liability they will have, then they can either reinsure that or we may have to set up a, a federal, re, a additional federal reinsurance program because uh, I don't want to force somebody to do business that they don't think makes sense for them, but I want to make sure that um, that it's available to the customer. So we there's going to be a tricky, uh, um, you know, tightrope we're going to have to walk on this, but I, I feel confident we can get there. And uh, I know that uh, it's important to the future of our economy and our economic viability. Yeah, you know, on that point, how would you... Uh what would you say might be the pathway or the timetable that you could envision uh, on this uh, on this effort? Well, I think we're going to start in earnest uh, in the lame duck session, but I think um, early next year, I would hope that we could get people together enough that we actually can make something happen. And um, I believe that, uh, you know, in the first six months of next year, uh, we should have something that's out of the house and pending in the Senate with the Senate starting to take action on it. So, uh, you know, that's uh, a lot of that'll be driven by what we see out there. If lenders do start to say, Hey, you have to have these coverages that may speed us up a little bit, but I personally think this is something we need to do right and not fast because if we rush a solution that doesn't solve the ultimate problem, we haven't really, you know, solved any, any, problems and haven't fixed anything. So I think it's really important that we try to actually fix something. That's, that's a great distinction. I mean, there are so many programs. And by the way, you, you and all members of Congress, frankly, should be thanked and congratulated for the early, quick, deep action that you took last spring regarding the CARES Act and the PPP program and other things, because the economy really uh, would be in a much more difficult situation. And all of that was designed, I believe, to get us to a period of time when the economy could run. And what we're talking about here is something that would click in to keep the economy moving forward. It's not a grid, but it's, it's on the other side. And, and we're talking about the next pandemic. We're not this, it would be, um, it would be wrong to require insurance companies to cover uh, cost for an existing pandemic, a, a risk they already know, and uh, but um, uh, that they weren't that they had excluded in their policies previously. But we're talking about um, this reins pandemic reinsurance act um, should be for the next pandemic and the one after that and the one after that uh, into the future and and building again private capacity and making sure that we um, keep business continuity and. Uh, hold these businesses harmless from some type of government shutdown. The other thing that's really important to me that we put in there that's not in Carolyn Maloney's bill is some type of uniform response to a pandemic that, uh, that has steps in it from the CDC that would start with things like social distancing and mask wearing and then raise up to maybe some limits on mass gatherings. And then the last thing, that hopefully we would never get to is some type of shutdown of our economy. But if we can put measures in place, uniform measures in place across the 50 states and a system that people can understand, it's not like, you know, somebody will snap their fingers and the economy is going to turn off without any warning. People will see it coming and, and we'll have a chance to take these interim steps that hopefully will work no matter what the pandemic is. That, that's a great, and, and as you know, I mean, we are very much involved in the business continuity of, uh, coalition. We're going to do everything we can to help uh, bring people together, and, and it's not easy, as you describe. I mean, different policy holder uh, businesses have different needs here, event yeah. cancellation, lease protection, financing protection, and things like that. And we need to solve it for everybody. It, it can't be just a micro shot. It's got to address events and event cancellation, leasing, and then regular business continuity and business interruption insurance. So uh, the, it's got to handle the entire uh, plethora of 
problems that would be created if we shut down the economy. Thank you. And uh, well, we pledge to work with you in a very positive way to get this. It's very important. Thank you for your effort. Jeff, I've enjoyed working with your members already on this and you and, and you guys have been great. Uh, you've been very constructive between what you and Nareed have done. You've moved the conversation forward. I really appreciate your approach. Uh, I'm trying not to pick any one approach, but taking the best from all of the approaches and put it together in something that works for everybody. And I think that's what uh, uh, I hope that's what Carol Maloney will do, too. I think it's something that will work uh, better than just trying to pick one approach. Just a couple of other items then, uh, not on, pen, on this issue. Thank you for that. But you're on a financial services committee, obviously, and you've uh, – what's your uh, odds on another relief bill or something being done now this year? And then uh, what would your priorities be maybe? Uh, so I, I do think we'll get one done, but not before the election. So the stopgap funding measure that we're going to pass, um, I'm not sure I'll be voting for it, but we'll pass this week out of the House, uh, goes through December 11th. So that tells me there will be a lame duck session. Uh, I believe there will be a pandemic relief bill in the lame duck session. The most important things to me are number one, liability protection for businesses that have reopened. Number two, some help for our state and local governments that have seen a hit in their revenues. If we would uh, free up the $250 billion we've already passed to, um, to be used for revenue shortfalls, that'd be a good start. If we want to add some money to it, that'd be okay too. If we're going to add money to that, I'd like to see us add money for infrastructure, 50 to $100 billion because gas tax revenues have taken a real plunge. And I'd like to see us do something uh, for people that are continuing to struggle. We have 8.4% unemployment uh, in August. By the time the September, September numbers come out, I believe it will be south of eight, probably in the sevens on unemployment. That's good news, but that means one out of every 15 of my constituents and your neighbors, Jeff, are struggling. And we need to do something to help them. Instead of plussing up un unemployment insurance the way we did, I would rather see us do a temporary... Um, um, rental assistance program. And I think it should apply to commercial as well as residential. Uh, people that are struggling, they have to certify that they're struggling, that their revenues or their income is down. And, you know, I would only take that assistance through the uh, length of the uh, pandemic. I would not make it permanent, but, um, but through the length of the emergency, which at this point is through the end of the year, uh, if we did that, I feel like it would um, uh, help the people that need it. And there's already a, an eviction moratorium. But if you can't evict somebody, but you don't get help for your rent, then you're picking tenants over landlords. And I'd like to see us uh, fix that problem uh, and do a temporary rental assistance program. Um, I would like to see us, um, you know, maybe extend unemployment for some of those people who've been on it a while and might have to be on it a little bit as well. And, and maybe a small plus up, but not the $600 we saw before. I'd rather see that aid targeted to, the, to where their real expenses are, maybe some, some food assistance, some rental assistance. Uh, and I think we've seen most people use the $600 responsibly, but I'd like to see it really go to where the issue is. And if uh, we're seeing landlords, uh, and I was told by a, a landlord that recently um, in September, they're a residential landlord, their, their uh, delinquencies were up uh, double digits uh, from about 7% to about 17%. So uh, I am concerned about that. And that's why I think rental assistance should be part of this too. And I hope that our rental assistance program can go backwards in time a few months to help make some of these folks whole. So those are some of the priorities I'd like to see in a bill. Uh, and I think we can come together on something like that. I'd love to see another bipartisan bill like the CARES Act was that got, you know, uh, almost 400 votes in the House of Representatives. Yes, that would be, that would be terrific. It's, it's really amazing to listen to the array of problems that you're dealing with. And, and these are all very serious. And again, thank you for what you did in the springtime with your colleagues and thank you for continuing to focus on it. Uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do because you're right, there, are, there is a lot of pain out there. Just one last point, I'm sure, sure. you're very pleased 
that football is back with Ohio State. I think you've got Nebraska coming up, right? We do. Uh, in a few weeks, maybe. And, um, and that, that, that is important to give people some a form of normalcy in a way. Yes. And uh, uh, bless you, sir, and have a great day and, and health. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I'm an Ohio State fan. We are excited to have football back on uh, October 24th and, and uh, bring on the corn, corn Huskers. We're excited to play Nebraska. All right. Very good, sir. Have a great day, and we look forward to working with you. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. I look forward to continuing to work with you and all your members. Thanks for uh, everything you've done to be a very constructive force in this pandemic reinsurance uh, effort that we're trying to put together. You're the best. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.